is wonderful to be here tonight. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be um, with my children and submit to their authority. And um, I just want to tell you just a few little things about me. Um, I just want you to know that God knew me before he put me in my mother's womb. And 75 years ago, that's when he did that. And he's given me many, many titles since then. I've had titles, and these are some of the titles that I've had. I've been a daughter. I've been a cousin. I've been an aunt. I've been a wife. I've been a mother. I've been a businesswoman in corporate America. And now I'm a missionary. And, but I want to share my heart with you. The greatest title that I've ever had is a servant of the Lord. Just a simple lover of God. I don't really need a title. If we read the book of Philippians, I think it's the second chapter, fourth chapter, Jesus was a man of no reputation. And that's what I strive for at this age. I don't have to have a reputation. But I do want to give you who I am. The only Jesus that I can give you is the Jesus that I know. I can't give you Mark's Jesus. I can't give you Robin's Jesus. I can't give you the best pastor that I follow and we all have our best. I can't give you Moses, David, any of the great men and women of God in the Bible. The only thing that I can give you is the Jesus that I know. And that's what I want to do tonight. I want to give you my thoughts. I want you to know where I've been. And I want to, I want to give you things that Holy Spirit has downloaded in me. You know, the Lord says, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And I'm so grateful that through this journey, all these titles that I had, there were many, many trials with these titles. I've endured many, many sufferings through all of these 75 years. I, I was born in a very, very dysfunctional family. But that was okay. I faced molestation at a young age. That was okay. I faced a marriage that a man committed suicide. That was okay. <laughs> because God was with me the whole time. And through those sufferings, it allowed me to cling to him and form a relationship. An intimate relationship. An intimate relationship. So it doesn't really matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter if you came from a good family or a bad family. When you choose as an act of faith, a simple act of faith, to believe in God, to know God, you're never going to know God if you just choose to come to a church building every Sunday. But if you find a place in your life, a secret place, and you just communicate, I want to know you, God. I want to, the Bible says that we can smell him. He's the rose of Sharon. Do you believe that? 
Bible says that his sheep hear his voice. Do you believe that? It's in that secret place that we learn how to decrease and he increases. And so what I want to share with you tonight is things that I've heard in my secret place. And I ask you, as a lover of God, to test the spirit, to have a witness to what the spirit of truth would say to us tonight. You know, I've heard tonight, you know, these are dark times. It appears to be that it's very, very wicked, evil, uh, for people my age, it's very, very hard to understand what we're listening to today and what we're seeing today. But I want to share something with you. This is probably one of the greatest, greatest times in the history of the church, in the history of mankind, spiritually what's going on, the kingdom is rising. God said that there would be a day that would come and the sons and daughters of God would know who they are in Christ. God said that this unshakable kingdom would invade the earth. Heaven Heaven is coming to earth. How's that going to happen? Where is heaven? If you're looking out there, you may be looking in the wrong place because heaven's within me. And heaven's within you. Through Christ crucified, he's given us all power, all authority to call those things that be not as though they were. You have that power. You have that authority. And he's waiting on the church to rise up. He's waiting on the church. How is the glory of the Lord going to fill the whole earth? How's that going to take place? I believe it's going to take place this way. It's a multiplication of the seed the second Adam, Christ crucified, the hope of glory. He dwells in us. He created us. He created you for that purpose, that he would live through the feebleness of a broken man. That's your purpose. You've been born in this generation. I've been born. I'm very, very excited to see the strength of the church. There's people all over the world globally. They're in secret places. You may not see it on the news. The only thing we see on the news, and I'm just going to be honest with you, is garbage. <laughs> and I don't care what channel you're listening to. It's not the spirit of the Lord. But there's something going on today very, very special. The kingdom is rising. There are people, this body, my children, you, there are people in this room now that know who they are in Christ. And the only way you could know who you are in Christ, you have to communicate with him. I mean, you know, he says in his word that we must worship him in spirit and truth. We know the word is truth, but you have to have the spirit and truth to have an eye to see the mystery of this gospel. There are things to come. Doesn't scripture say that? There are things to come in this kingdom. And those things are going to come through us. I want to share my heart with you, and I want to talk to you about this shift. This shift is here. 
And I do ask God to take the scales off of your eyes and open your ears that you can hear the spirit of truth and that you don't put your trust in a man. You have the man, if you know him. And you're able to hear him. You're able to walk with him in the cool of the day. You're able, he wants us to enter into this rest. So that means this. There's no weapon formed against you that'll prosper. None. So I don't care if your job has failed you. I don't care if your child has failed you. I don't care if your spouse has failed you. I don't care what really you're going through. When we enter into the rest of God, we have a life, an unshakable life. Mark just said that river. That river, that reminded me when Mark, when Mark said that, that river in the book of, I think it's Ezekiel. I just want that river. I want to be this deep in the river. I want to be consumed with the presence of God. Don't you? Don't you? I want to share this with you. I want to ask you a question. What do you think the ultimate goal is for the church? What do you think it is? Now, some of us would say these things. I'm going to read out some. This is what we would say. Is it more preaching? Is it more healing? Is it bigger home groups? Is it more evangelism? Is it more teaching? More prophesying? More activities, more deliverances. All of these things are what the church has been doing for decades. We call it the ecclesia. We call it the church. Right? Those that are saved, this is what we've been doing for years. The longer I'm in my secret place, this is what I sense. I sense there's a bigger goal. And I think his goal for me and you is Christ being formed in us by the Holy Spirit. That's what I, I believe that with all of my heart. Man producing God's nature and character which will produce the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. I want us to take a moment and I want, to, I want us to meditate on that. We all know the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. With the NIV translation, the book of Romans 8.11, it says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. It has that, I mean, that has nothing to do with our efforts of helping God out. Nothing. He moves through humble people who choose, who choose to be dead to self. If we choose to be dead to self, then your spirit man is going to rise. So what does that mean? What does that mean for our spirit man to rise? I'm going to say three words. God is love. Right? God is love. It means the fruit of the Spirit in Christ that flows through us is love. It's unconditional love which flows from a pure heart, and it produces joy and peace and faith. 
we may not like this, but I'm going to say this. Everybody counts. Don't they, Mark? Everybody counts. We may think they don't count because we categorize sin in our carnality of our mindsets, but everybody counts. God is no respecter of persons. He's not. I asked the people in the city that the Lord has given me, if they confiscated all of our Bibles and you did not have a Bible to open up and read, do you have enough Jesus in you to give away daily? Do you have enough for the person that falls, the person that just can't quite overcome their struggle? Do we have enough of the kingdom in us, the love of God? Do we have enough to make a difference and to shake, to shake this world and eradicate this darkness that we're facing? There's enough people in this room right here, if you really knew who you were in Christ, we could turn Douglasville upside down. This missionary field. Every city's a missionary field. You don't have to be called to another country to be a missionary. You just have to know who you are in the Lord. And I don't think it's about the crowds. I'm not saying the Lord doesn't move in big crowds. But I know my experience with him. When he called me to Oswa and I was almost 60 years old, I thought, oh, my God, this is nuts. You know, this is, I don't even understand what you're saying to me. I was on a bus in Haiti, and I, and I just was devastated because I, I, had a, I just had a nice life. I had a nice home in Florida, and I've had nice things, and, and I haven't had to work, and I could go up and down the roads to Georgia to see my family, and I could just do what I wanted, and I went on this mission trip from a church in Florida, and when I went into Haiti, I just, it took my breath. It wrecked my brain. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand that I was on a plane, and on that plane was all these missionaries, and I thought, why does this look like this? I've never seen anything like this in my life, and it devastated me. And I went on my bus by myself, and all the other team was out there. And I was just, I'm gutsy. I think people that know me know I'm gutsy. And so I just asked the Lord. I didn't know any way, any way to ask him, but I said, if, if you're here, when I look out over Port-au-Prince, this is what I saw. I saw a Methodist work, a Baptist work, a Pentecostal work, a Church of God work, a Catholic work. And I thought to myself, Lord, if you're here, why does this place look like this? And I love it when God talks to me. He's so gentle, and this is what he said. Unless the Spirit of the Lord builds the house, it's not going to be built. And smarty breaches me. This is what I said. If you're in church long enough, we know scripture, don't we? I said back to him, well, I know that. I know, you know, I said, that, I said, I know that. And I was having a conversation. I said, I know that. I said, I know that scripture. Unless the spirit of the Lord builds the house, it won't be built. And I was just crying. And then, and then he called me by name. He said, Diana, it takes one man to turn a nation. That was my intimacy with the Lord. That wasn't Moses. That wasn't my favorite pastor. That was a conversation that I was having with my Lord. And I said back to him, I said, I don't know what you're saying to me. Why are you, you know, why, I, I, I don't understand this. I, I, and he said it again, it takes one man to turn a nation. And the presence of God was just turning in me. And I told the Lord, I said, I can't do this. 
I don't know how to do this. I'm too old to go to school. I don't know. I've never been to evangelism school. I don't know what you're doing. And because of my love for him, I broke. And I just said these words. The only way I know how to do it, I'm just going to give you my hands. I'm going to give you my feet. I'm going to give you my mouth. I'm going to give you my eyes. And if you don't do it through me, I'm not going to be able to do this. There's no way that I'm going to be able to do this. And that was about 12, 13 years ago. And I can honestly tell you this, it has transformed my life. It has literally transformed my life. And when I first went into Haiti, I mean to the DR, I was in churches. And for about five years, I was in there, and I went home one day in, in, in my house, and I was praying, and the Lord captured my heart, and he said, I didn't call you to come over here and be comfortable in comfortable churches. If you will sit with the poor, I will give you the kings and the queens of the city. And that's what he did. And Victoria's been there. I've got my friends there, some of the wealthiest people in the city. I have the best attorney in the city. And I have the best broken, poor, that can give you nothing people and they have taught me more love. And God has broken me because everywhere you turn, you can't fix anything. You can't, it doesn't matter if you're looking this way outside the churches, if you're looking here, it's unfixable in the natural. And I made up my mind and I don't know if you can understand this. I made up my mind. I said, okay, God, I don't have enough money to feed all these people. There, it's, it, it's impossible. And over there, there's people, they're really, star they're really starving. They don't have jobs. They don't have food. They don't have water. They don't have houses. They, they don't have anything. And I had to realize that the kingdom was in me, and he was my provision. He's not just my health, he's my provision. And I made a decision that I was not going to beg. I made a decision that I was not going to put, oh, just gloomy pictures up that everybody would see, and, and I would say, I need this, and I need that. And I can tell you, for 13 years, I can, this is a true story, I can tell you for 13 years, people that I don't even know, people that are out on the streets that are lost and not even in a church has sowed finances when they found out what I'm doing and they ask me, I've had business in Florida call me in because a team went in and I went into a Jewish rehab center and and they said, I want to know what you're doing over there. What is going on? I said, I don't know what to tell you I'm doing. All I'm doing is touching one person at a time. And out of that conversation, a man that I had never met in my life that did not know the Lord handed me a piece of paper. And when I went out to my car, it was a $20,000 check. That'll make you shout. Won't that make you shout? Aren't you excited about that? that we serve a God beyond what we can think. He doesn't need me to perform for him. He needs me to sit in that secret place and learn how to live in him. Do you desire that more 
then you want to come to the building. Can you imagine what the benefit would be for the pastors if we came in with the presence of God and we came in to give, to give, instead of just one man wanting to give? Can you imagine how the world could shift and change? It's so true. And I can hear the Lord saying, wake up. Wait. God's not interested in us being religious. A religious spirit is what crucified Christ. God's interested in us allowing his son to move in us. Do you know that person is you? Do you understand that? Do you understand that you have the authority? You have just as much Jesus in you as my son has in him. You have the power. You have the ability. You have the know-how if you know who you are in Christ. You have the ability to speak to the mountain. And God's waiting on us to be a demonstration of his unshakable love. It's a love beyond a carnal man. <laughs> a carnal man does not know love. The word says it, our righteousness is as filthy rags. But when I know who I am in Jesus, and I know that I don't have to depend on myself, and I know I don't have to perform, I know I don't have to speak like Mark, I know I don't have to speak like my daughter, I know what I have to do, and I believe this, I'm going to say this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I know one day we're all going to stand before the Lord, and we're going to give an account of our lives, and I think the most, most important thing, I don't think the man out here that drinks six beers, and I'm going to say it, I don't think he's going to be in trouble. But I do think this. I think when I stand before him, I'm going to be judged by how well I've loved. How well have we loved? How well have we represented Jesus? How well have we allowed him to move through us? How well? How well have we chose to lose our life that we could have life in him? And we all have to ask that question. In the book of Galatians, and we all know this, I'm going to use the Passion Translation, Galatians 5. I love the word. Galatians 5, 22 through 26 says, But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit never set the law above these qualities for they are meant to be limitless. Keep in mind that we who belong to Jesus Christ have already experienced crucifixion. For everything connected with our self-life, God, I love this, was put to death on the cross and crucified with Messiah. Glory to God. If the Spirit is the source of our life, we must also allow the Spirit to direct every aspect of our life. So may we never be arrogant or look down on another. For each of us is an original. 
We must forsake all jealousy that diminishes the value of others. It's through intimacy with God that allows us to spiritually see the meaning of these scriptures. And the seriousness of this is real simple. It's, it's more simple than what we've made it. We're to love God with our whole heart and love our brother as ourself. It's that simple. Why do we make it so complicated? It's so simple. Why do we categorize sin? And I'm going to say this, and I know you're going to hear this. We sit in the church sometimes and we think about all the, we think about all the sexual sins, fornication, adultery, LGBT, anything that you can think of that pertains to the sexual part of a man. And this is what we do. We gag. We all do it, but we don't gag when we're talking about somebody. We don't gag when we're gossiping. Do we understand that when we talk about somebody that's broken, do we understand that those words produce death over somebody? If Jesus is living in us, then this is how we do it. We only say what we hear our Father say. Isn't it? Isn't that the truth? We only say what we hear our Father say. This shift is a movement that is replacing institutional structures. Without love, the church is not alive. It's just not. If you're not broken, if you're not repentant, if you don't carry humility, it's impossible to know the goal of God's heart for the church. I encourage all of us to get out of our mindsets that we want to hold on to a religious system. I want us to pick up the mind of Christ that Paul talks about in the book of Romans. And we all know it. He said, it's not I that lives. It's Christ that lives in me. That's the hope of glory. Holy God downloaded that in Apostle Paul. Love is the most powerful weapon on the face of the earth. And this is what it defeats. Fear. Pride. Greed. Envy, lust of the flesh, aren't all those things, things that operate in the carnality of a, of a man? Love, over 2,000 years ago, defeated these spirits. The true church... The true church, and I believe I'm going to say this with authority, this dwelling place is called Believer's Church, and I believe the presence of the kingdom is here. The true church is transitioning into his kingdom, and I'm going to say it like this. You can't put the kingdom in the church. The church has to come into the kingdom.
You can't put new wine in old wineskins. Jesus himself said, I have come to bring a kingdom. His kingdom is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Let's look, and I'm going to hurry. Let's look at Timothy's ministry to the church in Ephesus. Passion Translation, 1 Timothy 3, 5. As I urged you when I left for Macedonia, I'm asking that you remain in Ephesus to instruct them not to teach or follow the air of deceptive doctrines, nor pay any attention to cultural myths, traditions, or the endless study of genealogies. Those discretions only breed controversy and debates. They're devoid of power that builds up and strengthens the church in the faith of God. For we reach the goal of fulfilling all the commandments when we love others deeply with a pure heart, a clean conscience, and a sincere heart. I believe the church today is moving deeper into the goal that Timothy was talking about. Kingdom living is love. Doesn't the Bible say God is love? Let's meditate on that. Prophets have been prophesying for a while now about this shift, a paradigm shift, and apostles are arising to help lead people into the doors of kingdom living. I hope that each of you are transitioning at some level, running hard after God in an intimate place to be a part of this kingdom. These are some of the words that we're hearing today. Supernatural life, intimacy with God, Christ in you, God's manifested presence, transformation, being in love with God, relationship is the key to open the door of your heart so you can see the heart of God. You can see his kingdom. You can see the meaning of love, of real love. Love is the glue that replaces institutional structures. Intimacy with God through the Holy Spirit moves us into this shift. It opens the door to see the kingdom. Holy Spirit's our guide. It's not our mindsets. It's the mind of Christ. Holy Spirit's our guide. It's not a religious system. We don't go to church. We are the church. We don't join the church. We are the church. We are the church. The church is not passing away. The religious system is what's passing away. The fulfillment of scripture is advancing his kingdom and the greatest movement of God is coming in this very, very, very dark, depraved, demonic thing that we're seeing today that people in, at my age, we can't even comprehend half of this stuff that's even going on. But the greatest thing, the fulfillment of Scripture before the return of Christ, we see the earthquakes. We watch the weather patterns. We see the immorality in the earth. We see every nation is shaking. We see people are at war. We're seeing anger, frustration. We're seeing just all kinds of horrible, horrible things. But are we seeing this? Do we know who we are in Christ? Because this is getting ready to take place. And I'm going to close with this. This is what's getting ready to happen. Let's 
read the ESV. Let's go to John 14, 12 and see what it says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Let's read it again. Let's read it in the Passion Translation. And I want you to eat this in your spirit. I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believes in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do. Even greater miracles than these because I go to be with my Father. Now, I'm going to ask you this. Is that you? Is it you? Do you know it's you? Do you know it? If you know it, you should be shouting. Do you know it? Do you know that you will do greater works? Do you believe that? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know that your identity is Christ crucified in you? Do you know that? <coughs> this shift of embracing the kingdom will bring forth more sons and daughters of God and will do greater works than Jesus. And I want to prophesy this Prophesy it over the city of Oswa. We are a people that will release heaven and do on earth. And we will do greater works. No weapon formed against us will prosper. None. So you need to meditate and hear what the Spirit of the Lord says. And, and, and it's for you. It's for you. You will do greater works. <coughs> it's not about our age. I don't think there's any age in eternity. I don't think there's anything, such thing as retirement. From what I'm experiencing with Jesus, he just gets better and better. And I learn how to decrease more and more and more. And I strive to love more and more and more. I want to leave my grandchildren. I want to just love more and more and more. I want to love you more and more and more. And the only way that I'm going to be able to do that, I'm going to have to decrease. I'm going to have to get out of the way. I'm going to have to give up. I'm going to have to believe that I am the carrier that's going to release the glory of the Lord. It's us. He's waiting on us. And he's building an unshakable kingdom. And it's not run by a time clock. Eternity doesn't run by a time clock. Eternity is forever and ever. And it never, ever, ever, ever ends. Doesn't that make you excited? Huh? It makes me so excited. And I just want to thank you that I've been allowed to just share some of the thoughts that the Lord is giving me and the things that he's telling me. And anytime you want to come to the DR and sit with the poor, we would love for you to come. We would love for you to be able to share your love and share your testimony and lay hands on the sick and give somebody just a cup of water. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you walk into a house and there's no floor and the flies are so bad And you see a dirty blanket on the floor that if you pick it up, it'll, it would just disintegrate. 
and you see a wood, I guess it's a table. The legs are like tree stubs. And just a bird cage. And there's nothing else in there but a little woman that has her back turned to you. And the interpreter says to you, she wants to tell you something. And I said, okay. I want to hear what she's got to say. She just wants you to know she's blind. Or you go into a little village and you're pray and you're handing out you're just handing out bread. And you go into this these people's house and the children are playing and there's a mother pregnant and an, an older abuela, just like me. And there's a little old man sitting in a chair with a ball hat. You can't see his face. And you just want to be this. You want to release this kingdom. So you go over to him. And you just put your hand. I put my hand on his shoulder. And I wanted him to lift his little face up. Because I thought that he was shy. And I thought he just was real timid. And when I lifted his face up. Half of his face was gone. And you could take your fist, and you could put it all the way through. He, had, he was eat up with cancer. Those are beautiful moments. God shows me that that's where he's at. And God shows me that he takes care of these people. And there's story after story after story of opportunities that God has given me, and I would love to share those opportunities with you. So if you ever feel like you want to come, come. I love you with all my heart. I'm partial. I love this church. But more than that, I love what God's doing through my children. And I love you, and I hope that the Lord has given you something tonight that you can hold on to.